Hi there, this is Eric's. First of all, I want to thank all my regular listeners or viewers, all three of you, for checking out my podcasts. I hope you've been enjoying them. I've certainly enjoyed making them for you. I also want to thank all my various guests who have sat down with me week after week to talk about The Simpsons or The X-Files or whatever. It's been a real pleasure to do this, and I'm looking forward to many more conversations with all of you and some new people along the way. Now, I want to reassure you that the sudden lapse in my regular release schedule is a temporary hiccup due entirely to an increased workload and lack of available time. Don't worry, I will eventually get back to a more regular release schedule. As of next week, The Simpsons Countdown will resume its weekly release schedule on Thursday evenings for the remainder of Season 3. And I've got five or six episodes left for Season 2 of Discovering the X-Files, which will be dropped sporadically over the next month or so. At that point, X-Files will go on a brief hiatus, probably like five or six weeks, and return in its two-per-week schedule with Season 3. I've got some cool stuff planned for the Eric Antoine Network, They'll be dropping throughout the year, and I'm very excited about getting to work on all of that, so be on the lookout. In the meantime, just continue to support my stuff in the simplest of ways. Subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't already, and click on the little bell so you get notified whenever a new video pops up. For the time being, my stuff is mostly audio-focused, so maybe you prefer to enjoy it on your favorite podcast platform. That's great. That's why I do this, so be sure to subscribe there. And for example, if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, you can give me a favorable rating and even write a brief review, hopefully a positive one. It doesn't have to be a big thing, just like, great podcast, I love Eric's sultry voice, keep up the good work, whatever. Whatever you want. But these things help boost the podcast's profile, and that, along with spreading the word on social media, is really the best way to show your support, for now. As I said, I do have some cool things planned, and that includes more fun, let's call them interactive ways of showing your support. But I'll be letting you know all about that soon. Anyway, thanks for your patience. Yes, I've had to slow down these past few weeks, but I'm not going anywhere, so stick around. And now, sit back and enjoy your podcast. Chocolate. No! Mmm, chocolate. No! Marge, we need some more vanilla chocolate and strawberry ice cream. I'll get some at the store tomorrow, Homer. Mmm, chocolate. Hello, and welcome to The Simpsons Countdown the podcast where we go back to the beginning and watch all of The Simpsons, tracing the creative evolution of the series and counting down to find the exact moment in which it began its downhill journey into irrelevance. I'm Eric's Antoine, and this week I'm joined once again by the Penske Files' Clay McCormick. We'll be discussing Radio Bart, which originally aired on January 9th, 1992. In this episode, Bart receives a microphone that transmits sound to nearby AM radios. He decides to play a prank on the citizens of Springfield and tricks everyone into thinking a little boy is trapped in a well. This works out very well for him, and it's a lot of laughs, until he ends up stuck down in that well himself, and now the town is too angry to bother trying to rescue him. The episode was written by John Vitti and directed by Carlos Baeza, and features Sting playing himself in a clever cameo that satirizes the very popular rush of charity singles that dominated the airwaves throughout the 80s and 90s. There's quite a lot to discuss with regards to this classic episode. Clay and I are about to get into it. So without further ado, here we go. Hey there. I hear it's your birthday. How old are you? Well, I... That's great. Would you like us to sing you a special song? Hell no. You got it. Ready, Senor Bibarati? I'm already... And the one, and the two! You're the birthday, you're the birthday, you're the birthday. 
day, boy or girl. All right, so welcome back, Clay. Great to have you. Hey, thanks for having me again. I'm uh, always in, always happy to go through The Simpsons, uh, at least until a certain point, and then I'll stop answering your phone calls. Okay, yeah, um, you know, uh, to be perfectly honest, I think I'll probably stop calling. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I like. Well, I think when we get when we get to that point, if it really, you know, once we're at that point, I'm thinking that that will be the end of the podcast anyway. Sure. Sure. So, uh, you know, I'll, uh, I guess we'll see what happens. But so far, so far, so good. We're still in the good parts of The Simpsons. And we're doing Radio Bart, which which is actually one of my favorite episodes. I'll say mm. that up front. It's, it is one of my favorite episodes. It's one of the ones that, you know, as I've said before, I taped. I used to tape it on a weekly basis. And then right before I came here, it was around this time that I ended up moving to Bolivia. So I brought that VHS tape with me. This mm-hmm. is one of the episodes that was on the tape, and I would watch it a lot. This was one that I always came back to. I just, I've just i always really liked it for several reasons, which we'll get into, I guess. And I was wondering what your uh, opinion of it was up front before we get into the details. Yeah, I, I, I definitely remember this one. I remember watching it when it was on. Um, and, you know, it's funny. It's, it's never been one of my, like, go-to episodes um, because I think – Funny wise, I don't know if it's the funniest episode they've ever done, so it doesn't always stick out to me. But I do think it's very well written, and um, it, it's a really good story, and they tell it really well. And the stuff that they, uh, it's a really good example of the structure that they they kind of had going on in in this era, where it, it, what you what you remember the episode for usually doesn't kick in until about halfway through, where it's right. almost like there's a different story at the beginning that kind of transitions into, Oh, this is the one where Homer gets a heart transplant or whatever. Right. Um, and in this case, the, the Bart falling down the well doesn't really happen or, or the, the whole well element doesn't really happen till like maybe halfway through almost, or maybe a little less than that. But, um, yeah, it's, it's really well written. Uh, it features funky C funky do, which I'm <laughs> always a fan of. <laughs> yeah. Funky C funky do, uh, with the, what was it? I do believe we're naked. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's, it's the number one hit, uh, I Do Believe We're Naked, by Funky See, Funky Do. Uh, yeah, that was always a, a funny thing about that. Yeah, I think, uh, I guess I agree with you. I mean, I think maybe it's a, I, I'm giving a little bit more credit for some of the humor, maybe because there's gags in it that I always appreciated. But I, I guess you're right. It's not one of those, um, it's not a barrage of, of wacky gags. But yeah, it's a well yeah. it's a well written story, and one would argue because it's supposedly it is a uh, it's based on Ace in the Hole. Oh really? The yeah, Billy Wilder movie. Okay, yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. It's 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 based on Billy. What that's that's essentially what it's inspired by. Mm-hmm. Um, but it seems to be very loosely inspired because uh, reportedly the the writer John Vitti he had not even he had not actually seen Ace in the Hole. <laughs> When he, yeah. when, when he wrote the screenplay, when he wrote the teleplay, he basically, I guess somebody pitched it to him. Like, how about if this happens? And whoever it was that pitched it to him, whether one of the other writers who pitched mm-hmm. him the idea was thinking of Ace in the Hole, John Beattie was just like, yeah, whatever, okay, I'll write that story. And then he wrote that story, which of course has similarities with Ace in the Hole. And then it was, and then it was like, yeah, this is our tribute to Ace in the Hole. And he's all like, yeah, I've never watched that movie, so I don't know what you're talking about, but fair That's- enough. That's funny because I I never I never put that together. I always thought it was just uh, um, a reference to the, the, p- little kids falling down wells was like a I feel at least in my mind anyway it seemed like it was something in the zeitgeist at the time. I'm not really sure why. Uh, was wasn't there a, a kid who actually that happened to? Or am I, I thinking of something else? Maybe it's something I can't because I certainly don't remember any event at least not around that time. That was particularly, I mean, you're looking it up and that's great. I want you to do that. Um, but I, I certainly do not remember anything like that specifically. Uh, there might have been certain things involving kids, but I don't know if somebody falling down a well specifically. There, in 1986, uh, uh, there was a, a girl named Jessica McClure who was referred to as Baby Jessica who fell into her, and I, that, I recognize the name Baby Jessica, uh, fell into her into a well in her aunt's backyard, uh, and it took 56 hours to get her out. So I think I think that's the popular. I always thought that was the 
popular culture thing that they were referencing. It didn't occur to me that it was Ace in the Hole, but it's probably a combination of both. But but sure. clearly, clearly it's not Ace in the Hole on purpose because he had never seen the movie. <laughs> right, there you go. And uh, the thing is, so Jessica McClure, that's interesting. Jessica McClure, Timmy O'Toole. You mm-hmm. know, uh, I I guess, yeah, clearly they were thinking of that on some level. Um, wow, 56 hours. Um, but anyway, yeah, this has a bunch of funny gags. I like... It, it's what you were bringing up that it's you don't even get to the well until about halfway through the episode, right? So the first the first half of the episode revolves around Bart's birthday, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And it has that great one of my favorite gags is that when he goes to cash in all his coupons, mm-hmm. and and the very first one is where he walks up, he's like, I'm here for my I'm here for my free birthday Sunday, just like eat it yep. and get out. That's that's always been my favorite one. How it's this tiny, tiny thing, mm-hmm. and uh, that's you know it's obviously an exaggeration, but it's true that usually those sorts of things, you know, it's always that's usually the way it goes. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. like because you see the picture, they actually have a picture promoting the birthday Sunday in the store, and it's this poster that obviously paints it as this huge Sunday, this huge scrumptious Sunday, and then of course it's a tiny little mm-hmm. you know, bite-sized thing. So that's a that's a very funny gag. And then uh, the one thing that, popped, that I was reminded of that I always thought was fun was uh, Larry the Looter. Oh, sure. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That was one of those games. I think there was a lot of stuff that appeared in The Simpsons that didn't exist in real life that I wish did when I was mm-hmm. a kid. And I think that was probably one of them. Like I, I never uh, I never got into Tom and Jerry because every time I tried to watch Tom and Jerry, I was hoping it would be more like Itchy and Scratchy, but it never was. Right. Um, but eventually, instead of Larry the Looter, we got Grand Theft Auto, which is basically the same game. So maybe maybe it ended up working out. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's it's something that I, that came to my mind as I was watching it. Right. Because at the time, I don't think there were any games like that, were there? I no. Mean, I, I can't think of any video game. This is you know this is nine. This is well, the episode aired in early '92. So, mm-hmm. uh, but around that time, there wasn't anything where you were cast as an antihero. Mm-hmm. Nothing I can think of. Certainly not, not well, in popular mainstream. Not yeah, not super. Uh, there's probably I think there's a few scattered among the the depths of any of Nintendo and Atari at the time, uh, but I can't remember anything specifically. It's funny because the games that they represent in this show are always they're the games that your parents were afraid video games were, but video games weren't right. actually like that. The, the irony being is that video games of the 21st century are now finally the video games your parents thought that they were, where, you know, everybody lost their mind about Mortal Kombat because you got like four pixels of blood that sprayed when you punched people. And now it's now you get like up close x-rays of skulls cracking and people getting their hearts torn out and stuff. So, yeah. Um, they were they were prescient in that the violence level and change would be uh, accurate to all of everyone's parents' fears, I guess. Yeah, well, and part of it might have been because people watching The Simpsons, much like you and me, were like, oh, I wish there was a game like that. Right. And then like, right. well, now that I'm a game maker myself, fuck it, I'll just make a game like that. And then, right. and, yeah. and, there, and there you go. Like there, there, there's Larry the Looter, which, as you pointed out, is basically Grand Theft Auto. Uh, an arcade version of the principle of Grand Theft Auto where you're a criminal. Right. And that's that, that's the principle of the game. You have to steal things, commit crimes. Uh, I just, as we were talking, I just flashed to a an Atari game. Mm-hmm. I believe it's called Keystone Capers. Okay. And in that game, I'm pretty sure you're a thief. And you're okay. running away, and you're running away from cops mm-hmm. in like in like a hotel or in a no no yeah it's like a shopping mall I think and you're like jumping around grabbing stuff and that's that's sure. what it is like so you're the thief trying to get away from the cops and so okay there you go I guess it existed but it was what's, not as as intense. What's uh, I'm actually kind of surprised, and maybe maybe this has been done and I just I, I, it hasn't come across my desk. I'm surprised that no one has actually made these games because like like fans or something made like a, a flash version of bone storm or uh larry the looter or something it seems like something that a, a simpsons fan would would have done by this point i also do remember though um in the early days of cd-rom i had this simpsons cd-rom that was the only thing you could do it wasn't a game 
it, sure. it basically was just a virtual, I think it was called virtual Springfield. And you just, it placed you in Springfield and you could just wander around the streets of Springfield and go into the different places. Like you could go into Moe's or you could walk to the Simpsons house and walk around inside the house. And if you went to the Quickie Mart, I do remember they had either, they had arcades in there, arcade cabinets, mm -hmm. and that either had playable versions of these games, like very short playable versions of like Bone Storm or, or Larry the Looter, or it triggered like an animation or something. I can't remember exactly which one, but I, man, I love that thing. That was so awesome. That was, you, you could, just being able to walk around Springfield was very cool. And having little, little Easter eggs like that play out was, was very, very cool. Well, that sounds great. And I'm surprised that they haven't thought of like revamping that in some way, because I do remember that. I never I never owned it myself and I never really got to play around with it. Um, but I do remember hearing about it and being curious of it. It was because it was in the dawn of CD-ROM, as you were saying. So mm -hmm. it was a big deal. So it was basically like a more animated mist with Simpsons, right? With like, yeah. A, so you're basically exploring a town because it was in first person, right? It's, right. it's yep. like you're there. And I'm thinking now with like VR technology, I'm surprised oh, sure. no one yeah. is saying, "Hey, let's let's revamp this thing, but make it a VR experience." So you're actually walking around Springfield. That would be pretty amazing. I'm surprised that it hasn't happened already. I actually just looked it up. It is called Virtual Springfield, and you can watch an entire like walkthrough of it on YouTube because, of course, you can. So if <laughs> if anyone's interested in checking it out, it's available to to see. Yeah, well, I'll definitely, that's that, that's something to, to look into. And you might be right about Larry the Looter, because I'm remembering now that at some point, this would be a few years now, that I was just like dicking around on the computer, you know, as one does, looking at mm -hmm. emulators and things like that, like downloading mm -hmm. old games. And I came across a page that I think you could play Larry the Looter. Oh, really? Or, yeah. I don't know if it was Larry the Looter or Escape from Grandma's House, one of those games. And it was, but it was... um. Yeah, no, it was, it, now I'm thinking, yeah, it was Larry the Looter. And and you could play it right there on the computer, like using your keyboard and whatever, and it mm -hmm. was like a screen that opened up in the center. So maybe that was ripped from the virtual Springfield thing. Maybe that's what you could do. Maybe you could actually go to the arcade and play these games, play, and they must have been very simplistic games. Yeah, like from, from what I remember. There's much to it. From what I remember, yes, it was, it was a very simplistic thing. But yeah, that doesn't surprise me. If that's out there, it doesn't surprise me. Yeah, yeah, it might have come from there. So, yeah, but anyway, as you said, I mean, Grand Theft Auto is essentially that's what it is. It's Larry the Looter uh, taken to the highest level. So you know, there's a scene when Bart rejects Homer's gift. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like yes. a, like a, he he's had enough of like these terrible terrible gifts that he's getting, including a a cactus. <laughs> um, and, and but that like that scene is genuinely poignant because like you have Homer. I bet you think nothing's gonna top that cactus. He hands him this thing. He's really happy, really excited to get him this gift, and he, he just sort of like blows it off. And Homer's look of genuine like he's like genuinely hurt mm -hmm. by how Bart like rejects his his gift. And I thought that that was that stuck out at me now is that even though the show was getting funnier here in the third season they still made room for moments like this that were uh, more realistic, more like poignant. Right. You know, right. like it's a genuinely heartwarming moment. Like you, you feel bad for Homer at that moment. You're like, oh, that's kind of shitty of Bart to treat him like that. Uh, and, you know, so like it's, it's a genuine thing that you feel. Yeah. They, they're, they're always good at, at um, accurately portraying. I don't know how many of them had kids at this point. Cause I think the writers were, still fairly young overall but mm -hmm. uh they were always really good at portraying r like honest but like i don't know what the word is uh painful interactions between kids and parents like that it, that's a the kid th being uh very dismissive of the present is just it's the best intentions of a family member who buys a present for a younger kid like i it's it's one of those things you don't really understand until you get older because i remember right. being bart's age and thinking some of these presents are kind of kind of suck um <laughs> and clearly there's you know i've i've had one or two memories where a family member got me something that they were psyched about and i could not have cared less about 
and you don't really realize how much that stings until you are older and then do that with a kid. So you you get right. You buy something for a kid and you're like, oh, they're gonna love this, and they just throw it over their shoulder, and you're like, oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. There, there's there there are two sides to that though, because that actually makes me think of. Of course, I remember we've all had this experience. You know, whether it's a birthday or a Christmas thing or whatever, we the family mm -hmm. member, family member or friend of the family who comes and gives you a gift. Um, I I don't think I ever had an experience quite as bad as as Bart. You know, like I like yeah. I remember anyone ever giving me like a cactus, right. you know, right. like, or or anything of that nature. You know, the worst thing I might have gotten is like a you know a sweater or some stupid thing mm -hmm. that I, I would never wear, um, like that that I can remember. But as far as like uh, there were all there was all, there were always those situations where you could tell that Uncle Steve or whoever obviously went to Toys R Us to the bargain bin made a mm -hmm. beeline for that because that's you know <laughs> and he's like ah, i gotta get a present for the fucking kid all right well what do they got here oh those action figures he'll probably like that so you just like grab the first thing that's like 5.99 off the shelf because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that's all you're gonna do and that's what you do and so in the 80s which is when i would have been about uh bart's age there was this moment in which i was getting tons of toys from an action figure line called power lords okay i don't know which that one. Yeah, and I, I'm sure like no a, one does. Like a He-Man, a He-Man ripoff. Basically, yeah, it was yeah. basically kind of a he. Uh, uh, it was put out by Ravel. Okay. Um, it was put out by Ravel. It was like their their one and only, I think, incursion into the action figure market. Mm -hmm. Um, since Ravel are known for making models, right? Um, that you have to put together models. Sure. And it was like this. They had action figures. I think there was a, a short-lived comic book probably i think put out by marvel power lords like a limited series like three or four issues and then you had it was like a it was very similar to he-man there were these slightly large action figures there mm -hmm. was even a board game okay oh really and, and wow. so i i had a bunch of those action figures i had the board game it's stuck in a box somewhere i never played the board game but I'll, you know, I'll be fair. I did play with those action figures sometimes because mm -hmm. since they were about the size of He-Man, you know, I I could mix and match them with my yeah. He-Man and just sort of have a good time. I just yeah. I just looked them up. I've never seen these before in my life. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, there, there's there some, you are. There's something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're, it's it's not as bad as like getting a cactus or whatever. Sure. Else. Sure. Sure. Um, and then it happened like that. I have one story. Uh, this and this would have been around the time of The Simpsons. Okay. Uh, where I'm in New York, I'm living in New York, and a friend comes to visit, comes to like spend a few days at, at the apartment, a friend of my dad's, a guy from France who was in town uh, working on a documentary or something. Don't remember the details. Point is, he's in town for a few days, whatever, he sees that I've got a Sega Genesis, sees that I'm a gamer, sees that I'm into games. He's like, oh, hello, you know, and just trying to be cool, trying to relate to me. Um, and he asks me if I like role-playing games. He referred to them as role games. Do you like role games? And I'm like, sure, sure, sure. yeah, whatever. You know, I, I don't, at that time, I don't think I had any role playing games, but, you know, I'm playing Sonic the Hedgehog or whatever it is. So a couple of days later, shortly before he leaves, I guess he wants to do something nice. You know, his, his, his friend let him stay, let him crash. The least he can do is get a gift for the guy's son. You know, it's a fairly nice thing to do. And he must have found this at some electronic store, probably on sale because it wasn't. And so he, he gives me this game uh, called King's Bounty. It's the name of the game. Okay. Uh, uh, put out by Electronic Arts for the Sega Genesis. King's Bounty. I think it was also on computers. So he's like, hey, I got you a game. I'm like, oh, thanks. Now, I wasn't an asshole like Bart. Even though I never heard of this game that he gave me, I was gracious enough to say thank you. Oh, mm -hmm. thanks. I appreciate that. Whatever, right? And, you know, I was even nice enough to open it up right then and there and, like, pop it into my machine and start playing. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and it was a really funny experience because the guy's sitting, you know, behind me as I pop it in and I start playing it and you know it's not a very good game it's not yeah. you know this this is not one of the top line uh, role-playing games so I, I'm playing it for about five or ten minutes you know sort of trying to figure out how the how the fucking thing works and I, I like I hadn't even bothered looking at the instructions the instruction manual was like 100 pages long I was like, <laughs> I'm like you know and so, and so like I'm, I'm thinking around and at one point the guy's just kind of like oh 
sorry, it's not very good, is it? And I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> and I just turned and I go, I don't know, I guess it's all right. You know, I, I'll give it a chance, I told them. Mm-hmm. You know, but the, and, you know, I, uh, I don't think I ever really gave it much of a chance. But the point yeah. is that uh, that's, that's the thing. It's, uh, this is the sort of thing that happens. But uh, I don't think I ever had an experience quite as horrendous as Bart's experience. Uh, yeah. Do you have any specific experience you can remember of anyone giving you a particularly terrible gift? Um, te- terrible is a is a loaded word because like sure. you're, like you're saying it's sure. it's the thought that goes into it is is there, but yeah. like as as a six year old or an eight year old or whatever, it's not what you are hoping for. Yes. I I know um the for some reason the one that sticks out is when I was really young probably like six i think my cousin bought me a bought me a pair of loafers <laughs> for, i think she was working at a shoe store up the street at the time and she just bought me a pair of loafers and i was like distraught because <laughs> i i just not, not not just because it wasn't a toy but like i remember very actively not liking that style of shoe <laughs> <laughs> As a six-year-old, I didn't have a lot of fashion opinions, but I did not like loafers, yeah. and uh, uh, so I was I was not uh, thrilled with that. But it, I do I do remember thinking that like getting getting the wrong toy is almost somehow worse than if they had you know got you nothing at all because I or video games especially because it's like uh, oh yeah I'm, I'm into video games if someone buys you the wrong video game. Yeah. You just like, what the fuck? Why are you wasting my time? Like it's, it's you, cause in the back of your head, you're like, Ooh, I hope I get Sonic three or something. And you end up right. with King's bounty. And it's just like, right. Ugh. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, and again, you know, kids, all kids are, respect. kids are awful. So that's just, kids are just, terrible. Just, yeah. Yeah. Cause the guy was, per- I mean, the guy was trying to be nice. The, 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 the one thing I remember about that was the fact that he himself acknowledged in real time, yes, yeah. that the game that he had gotten for me was terrible. So, like, uh, I think that that was a kind of uh, that for him must have been a, an interesting experience where, like, I was being perfectly gracious, mm-hmm. but he was just like, "Ah, oh, shit, I fucked up. I got him a pretty shitty game. Oops." Yeah, I was yeah. just gonna say before we move yeah. on, what's fo- yeah. what's nice about that scene, though, is it's it's not just Bart being a jerk for the sake of being a jerk. Like the stuff he's getting isn't great. No, it's like not. the cactus isn't great. The socks aren't great. Uh, being able to dress like Martin isn't great. Um, so it's it's that much more. Uh, label maker's pretty cool, I guess, if you have enough distance to realize how cool a label maker can be. Yeah, sure, definitely. I'm like, yeah, like that's see. a badass gift. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, very. It's a very practical gift. Um, so it it they don't they don't play it like he's just being a jerk for the sake of being a jerk. They they kind of have a couple things going on and it makes the scene work that much better because of it. Right. Well, I mean, it's a, it, it is a basically kind of shitty birthday party, right? Mm. Because like what we see is like, yeah, he's having the birthday party at Chuck E. Cheese. Um, it's not Chuck E. It's what is it? Wall E. Weasel, I think. Yes. Like, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So like, but you know, it's, Chuck I e. always, I always <laughs> love the song that they sing the, the non-specific birthday song where they said, you're the, you're the birthday boy or girl. Yeah, yeah, that's a great one. And the and you know the animatronic puppets are all fucked up, like it's mm-hmm, not working mm-hmm. properly. One of them breaks. The the very exasperated like uh, guy dressed in the suit. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love that that shot of like him jumping onto the stage with the fire extinguisher. Mm-hmm. And the funny thing is like if you look obviously the costume, it's like the the weasel guy with the big smile on his face. But in, there's like that space where the guy's eyes are, and he's yeah, clearly just yeah. like. He's clearly Scowling. pissed off. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Like, and so like, it's, it's, uh, that is very funny. So yeah, you're right. It builds. It's not, it doesn't come out of nowhere. It's like, mm-hmm. he's having a pretty mediocre birthday party as it is. Uh, on top of that, when time comes for the gifts, he's getting a bunch of kind of shitty gifts, uh, nothing that really excites him. And so he's like, he can't wait. And like, Oh, here's, here's a gift from your dad. And you're thinking it's relatively big box. And it turns out to be this, thing that you have no idea what the fuck it is and you didn't want it so uh, so yeah it, it builds it builds properly actually about that microphone was there anything like that i'm trying to remember if i anything think like that there was i believe there is a there actually is a toy that does that and i don't think it works it definitely does not work as well as it works in this show 
Uh, I, you you definitely could not control a radio that was like six blocks away down a well. Um, I think it was more I think it was more similar to the way Homer uses it, where it kept feeding back, and it was you know it, it I I don't remember the specifics of what it was called, but I do think that that was a toy that did exist at some point. Yeah, it might have been like the idea is for you to use it like a karaoke thing, and like a song that you like comes on the radio, you're gonna sing along to it like like Convoy. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a song all the kids love. That's a, such a weird, <laughs> every, such a every weird kid's commercial. favorite movie, Convoy. <laughs> yeah, it's such a weird commercial. Like that, that. I mean, it's it's both weird and accurate because mm-hmm. if you look, if you think back on the way commercials were, you know, early '90s, they weren't always like with it, quote unquote. Right. You know, so right. so it would make sense that like you'd have this kid singing. Maybe it wouldn't be Convoy, but it would probably be some stupid song that. No kid from 1991 or 1992 would think is a cool song. Yeah, uh, it's <laughs> well, it's funny because like it's a commercial that's perfect for Homer. Like Homer would sing Convoy. Yeah, you know, and he and Homer does get his interest peaked by driving down the street and making <laughs> remarks at women through the radio. He th- thinks it's kind of fun, but it's it's very much a character. It's it's a toy commercial, but it's very really geared towards Homer. Yeah, yeah, exactly, uh, and of course he he buys it. He buys the whole thing, hook, line, and uh, sinker. Um, so yeah, that, I mean that's the first half of the episode. The first half of the episode sets up the microphone, uh, and then we get to the whole thing yeah. about the, the and, label, the label maker. Very importantly, the label maker. Yes, you're right. The label maker, which from a storytelling perspective, you know, uh, mm-hmm. the label maker is uh, what is it? Chekhov's gun. Yes. Uh, yeah. The, the, yeah. The, the label maker, which is shaped like a gun, is Chekhov's gun uh, mm-hmm. for uh, for this uh, episode. So that is very uh, that's actually a very perceptive point. So then the second half of the episode is what most people seem to remember about this. Mm-hmm. Right. Which is the whole thing about the well. And it sort of leads into a very inspired uh, we are the world parody. Yes. That's uh, that's ultimately what I think it is. It's a very inspired. We are the world parody. Uh, a parody which is kicked off by Krusty doing this really rambling story about how he met up with Sting. Like, mm-hmm. that, like that, that's mm-hmm. a that's a funny exchange between him and and Kent Brockman about how like the whole thing came together. And the implication is that it's just him and Sting. You know, like Sting basically wrote the song, and then that's kind of how We Are the World is, though. Like it's very clearly We Are the World. Like I assume you've watched the original We Are the World video. Oh, from, definitely. Like, Definitely, you know, and, yeah. and the one that show, you know, it's, it shows you the behind-the-scenes footage as well. So mm-hmm. it keeps cutting to all the people who are participating. So you know, and so like it's just funny watching this now. I'm like, yep. And Krusty is Springsteen. Krusty yep. is in this. Yep. He's de- <laughs> he's definitely he's Springsteen in this uh, in this parody. If we are the world, he's taking the Springsteen part. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. It's it's funny because uh, it's we are the world is definitely the the um prime example but at the time this was really like a hip thing to do to do these like multi artist charity singles uh like they did do they know it's christmas in 1984 yeah. and then they did we are the world uh there was a heavy metal one which is my favorite called stars which was uh produced by ronnie james dio and just has like all of the biggest names in heavy metal performing on it Wow, uh, I never heard yeah. of that. Tell me more it's, about that. It's awesome. It's uh, if if you, if you're into '80s heavy metal, it's got it's literally we are the world, but it's all heavy metal guys. So like each different heavy metal singer has a, a a little bit that they sing, and then everybody sings on the chorus. And there's a whole extended section in the middle. Like the the uncut version of the song is like eight and a half minutes, and I'm pretty <laughs> sure about six and a half of those minutes is just guitar solos, because they pass it around to all of these different heavy metal guitar players who just each do their little bit of shredding for a couple seconds. <laughs> and uh, there was another one. There's a really, f- <laughs> that as, as they kind of like got more and more specific and kind of ran out of large scale causes to back, they kind of get sillier to watch. Like there's one from the early nineties. I can't remember what it's for, but it's, it's, it's specifically, for something in Canada and it's all Canadian singers. So it's like Getty Lee from Rush and Neil Young and Peter Cetera 
and like a really random assortment of people that you kind of go, what the hell do these guys have in common? Oh, they're all from Canada. Um, and there's another one from a few years later that was another heavy metal one where it was, uh, uh, they did a cover of Smoke on the Water, and it was like, I, I don't even know if I would call it, it was more like a hard rock thing, but it, it was like Bruce Dickinson and the guys, the guys left guys who, the guys who were left from Queen, uh, Paul Rogers from Bad Company, like just a really <laughs> weird assortment. And you watch the video and they're all showing up in like shorts and stuff. And none of them oh are my God. dressed up for the stage or anything. It's just a bunch of guys coming to do this thing. But it's it, it, this stuff was parodied all the time. Like they used to it felt like one of the running things they would do on SNL all the time in the early 90s was some version of a charity thing where everybody's doing an impression of somebody like Adam Sandler's doing Axl Rose and et cetera, et cetera. It was it was an easy target for the time. Yeah, I mean, because it was going on. You're right. It was something that was going on uh, all the time uh, for this or for that. And I would say that probably the best parody, in my opinion, at least, or at least the most spot on one or the most like cutting one uh, predates this by several years. It's from 85. And it's actually uh, I'm a big fan of the band Chumba Wumba, which I think is a, is a, is a sentence that a lot of people a lot of people don't say I'm a big fan of the band Chumba Wumba, <laughs> yeah. um, but I am. I'm a big fan of them, uh, and I came to know them like most people in the mainstream because their big hit, uh, you know, the tub thumping. I was gonna say I assume being a big fan means you know two of their songs, yeah, as opposed right. to just the one that most people know. <laughs> well, there, you, yeah, exactly. And the thing is, like, I became curious of them because I got mm. that album because I, you know, I thought that was a catchy tune, but it was when I began to explore the band and look look into their their earlier things that I actually became a fan of them and realized, no, this is actually a really good band. And their first album is from 1985, and it's called Pictures of Starving Children Sell Records. Nice. And that's basically what it is. It's, it's, a, it's a critique of Band-Aid, Live Aid, you know, and it's essentially, it's, it's like 25, 20, it's not more than a half hour long, the whole, mm -hmm. the whole album. And I'm pretty sure the whole thing's on YouTube, so I would recommend that anybody just take back and and listen to Pictures of Starving Children Sell Records. And it is hilarious. It truly is hilarious. It's very, uh, it doesn't take any, it doesn't pull any punches. You know, mm -hmm. everybody gets shit on, everybody. When was from, this from? Uh, this is from 85. Oh, wow. So, yeah, okay. so that's like, like right after it, Hearing yeah. Aid and uh, the other one. Yeah, I mean, Bandit. yeah, because they're from because they're from um, the UK, they obviously, I guess, they focus more on those people, but they mm -hmm. do focus on everybody. I mean, there's there's like a sample of "We Are the World" in the in the oh, album, really? in, in the big <laughs> closing number, or maybe it's the opening number, but in one of the numbers, there is a snippet of "We Are the World" stuck in there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, it's the part where. Uh, where Ray Charles says, come on, let me hear you, you know, like that. Sure, sure, so, yeah. Like that, that part's like stuck in there at one part. So um, that's great. Like that's actually really, uh, really biting because it brings up the question that like, I think, like I'm not so cynical to just dismiss it and be like, oh yeah, they're just cashing in. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're just, they're just trying to score some points. They're trying to act important. I, I think I'm not that cynical. I do think that like Sting and Peter Gabriel and whoever else, you know, all these people who participate, Bono, you know, mm. I do think I do think that their heart is in the right place. I mean, the do they occasionally do stuff that's very self-aggrandizing? Of course, because at the same time they're trying to sell records. Sure, but I sure. do I do think that it does come from a genuine place, and they're like, yeah, you know, I do care about these issues, and I do want to use my platform to bring attention to these issues and maybe raise some money and whatever else. So I do believe in it, but it still comes off as kind of insufferable either yeah, way. Like yeah. even if, even if the heart's in the right place, it's like Bono, can you just sing? Can you just, yeah, I think, I just... think the key is how good the song is because, uh, do they know it's Christmas? Pretty good song. Yeah. We are the, we are the world. Pretty good song. And yeah. if I, if I do say so myself here in a, or stars by what was called hearing aid. Good song. Um, but like, as the songs get worse, it just seems a lot more. The, it really, it really, uh, you lose a lot of the shine if the song isn't very good. Um, right. And uh, I, I do, I do really like um, 
at the end of this at the end of that sequence and actually uh sending our love down the well not a bad song it's for for uh for what it is no no i mean i'm i'm not sure i'd have to look into the behind the scenes details but i, I think sting actually had a hand in that He's, it wouldn't surprise me it seems like know, in the early days the guests did a little bit more than just show up and read their lines which is what it seems like they do now but um the uh i do i think my favorite part of that bit is at the end when they ask Krusty where the money goes, and he's like, well, they got to pay for all the limos, we got to pay for all these trailers, and then, you know, whatever's left, we throw it on the well. And I was like, yeah, that's that's what I've always felt about these things. It's like, what is the overhead cost to actually produce this? I, it's the f- same yeah. way that I feel about, like, again, I don't have a problem with the the sentiment at all, but, like, every time they do the the pink breast cancer stuff for, like, football and everything and all that kind of stuff, Every time I see that, I, all I can think is, why don't they just s- send the money that it costs to make this stuff to the charities that they're talking up instead of making a bunch of stuff they're going to use for a month and then, like, unless they auction them off or something, but I don't know. It seems like it seems like you could uh, you could do more good actually donating the money instead of, you know, making a show out of it. But who's to say? I don't know how I don't know how these things work behind the scenes. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, I don't look uh, locally. I've got I'm in a couple of bands. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, I, of course, I'm not anywhere even remotely near the level of any of the people that we've been talking about. But my point is that being in local bands, there are occasionally local charities and local things that happen. And so uh, you want to show your solidarity for mm-hmm. some kind of a cause, whether it's somebody who's sick and they're trying to raise money for their treatment or whatever it is, something something relatively small. And so in a small scale, this is what happens in my like I can say, so I'm, I'm, I'm a member of a relatively popular local bar band. Okay, we do, we do 90s covers on weekends. And so like they'll organize something and what will happen, they'll say, hey guys, so you know, would you be willing to participate? Proceeds are going to fund this cause. Uh, we obviously can't pay you mm-hmm. because, like, a, like the cover charge is going to go for that. And you know, the only thing we can do, like, we'll cover your expenses. We'll cover your transportation. You'll 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 obviously get you know some free booze. Mm-hmm. But like, that's it. Like, you know, uh, the mon- there will be no money. We won't be able to to pay you. Right, and, right. and so, like, one then agrees. Okay, fine. We're doing it. Basically, we're doing it for the cab fare and booze. All right, fine, deal. Mm-hmm. We'll do it. We'll do it. Okay. So now extrapolate that. You know, ex- extrapolate what I just said to like, you know, Band Aid, where right, you're talking right. about like the biggest rock stars in the world, huge event, huge concert event with obviously millions of dollars coming in. Mm-hmm. And I don't, you know, look. The biggest rock stars, it? the biggest rock stars in the world, and Dan Aykroyd for some Yes. Reason. Yes, for for whatever reason. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And and so like, obviously, it's the same thing. I mean, mm-hmm. I you know, except we're talking about millions of dollars, you know, but things who do have to be paid. Everything that Krusty lays out makes sense. Yeah. There are limos. There is catering. There is you know the production of the video. Like the, nobody's going to work for free. Nobody. Right. It's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I've always been curious about that because like you would. You would you would hope that the people who are involved in these things are doing it for literal charity and not taking any money from it. But honestly, who's to say? Because I it's one of those I feel like it's one of those things where it's kind of like playing the Super Bowl. You know how they they don't actually pay anybody to play the Super Bowl because the exposure is so gi- is so gigantic that people do it for free. Because it exposes them to the largest possible audience in a single 15-minute set or whatever. At least that's what Mm. they say. Sure. And uh, I feel like there's probably a bit of that built into it. Like if you're part of – if you have – if if you get the the Huey Lewis verse of of, uh, We Are the World, (laughs) you're in the company of Michael Jackson – Ray Charles, Bob Dylan. Like you're instantly in that group and it's a song that everybody's going to hear. So it's a big platform. So it's like if you're smart, you go like, well, yeah, I mean, I don't need to take any money for this. And also, I would assume that if they did something like that now and it came out that somebody took 
would did it for money, they would get absolutely destroyed for it. But absolutely, we'd all hear about it. We, yeah, like, yeah, that would be the first thing we hear about it. Yeah, and the, but I, um, I feel yeah. the same way about like Live Aid. Mm -hmm. Like I, I don't. I assume they weren't getting paid to show up at Live Aid, but it's like if you're a band and you go, man, if we nail Live Aid, we're gonna, it's gonna, our profile is gonna explode, and I, that's basically what happened with U2 and Queen. Is before right. Live Aid, U2 was kind of like a moderately no band, and then they killed it at Live Aid and they exploded. And then Queen did the same thing. Well, they Queen kind of reinvented themselves at Live Aid. Right. I mean, they, they had their big comeback, as we all learned from the epic motion picture Bohemian yes, Rhapsody. Yeah. Led, uh, Zeppelin, <laughs> Led Zeppelin, unfortunately, on the other hand, not so much. Oh. Uh, I am a massive Led Zeppelin fan, and for many years I had been wanting to see the footage of them getting together to play at Live Aid. And when I finally did, I don't even think I finished it because it's really, really bad. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know that I've seen that particular bit of footage. I've seen oh, everything it's terrible. else. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I've seen Queen, I've seen Phil Collins, I've seen Phil Collins fuck it up. Well, actually, that's I don't know it's a live band bandaid, but like I, uh, I've I've seen uh, Phil Collins fuck up on the piano. That's part of it. Oh, sure, um, sure. <laughs> Ultra Box. I don't know. Uh, uh, what's his face? The guy. Uh, the, You're the voice. Um, John Farnham, I think. Was oh, his okay. Name. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so, but Led Zeppelin. Wow, that's uh, yeah. At, and it's they really bombed. Wow. They, yeah, they it bombed. was it was real bad. They um. I think it's one of those things where they oh, had like they owned the footage or something. So anytime that they reissue stuff, it's not it's not part of it because they don't like it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was one of those things where I think Jimmy Page was handed his guitar out of the case and nobody tuned it. And the sound was terrible. And they literally hadn't played together for like seven years at that point or five years or whenever it was. And uh, they were playing with a new drummer. I think they only had like a couple rehearsals, and it just, it just, it's not great. Yeah, well, that's that's very unfortunate. That's uh, that's really too bad. But um, yeah, two thousand nine, when they got to get back together for real, they nailed it. So ah, yeah. now you're, yeah, uh, we we've spoken about it uh, off the record. Uh, the Led Zeppelin's like your favorite band, right? Oh yeah, yes, very much so. Yeah, so that's uh, I, I can imagine that must have been disappointing. Yeah, but to, to wrap up that topic, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, we can't presume to know exactly how these things work. Right. right. Uh, obviously, probably bands don't, you know, they don't get paid, or they certainly don't get paid. It's not like they pass out their rider for the charity show. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's like, yeah, you know, we're taking a pay cut here, you know, but we're getting a lot of publicity. We're we're right. participating in this huge event, and our next tour is gonna sell like hotcakes so we're good like that's that's fine uh just you know make sure that you pay for our transportation and give us food right uh, I, I guess that's as far as it goes and that's all good um we'll go up there we'll play for half an hour we'll rock and you know thank you uh, if thanks for the space yeah if you feel collins you go out of your way to stand out by playing at both shows by did he, he didn't he play in england and then he took the Concord to New Inc to New York or wherever and played at that show too. I think. I I believe so. Yes. Yeah. I believe so. <laughs> yes. That's, uh, good. that's a good that's a good gimmick. And I, I don't know I don't know in which one um, I don't know in which one he fucked up, you know, and that's on the tape. I don't know if it was in the if he was in England or if he was in New York, but but in one of them he definitely fucks up and he sort of acknowledges <laughs> it and just keeps going, because um, uh, I, I guess. They were either drunk or high or both or just as you said. Yeah, he not just much, took a, not much rehearsal time. He just you know, took a plane uh, from England and he's yeah. probably a little weirdly jet lagged. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, love it or leave it though, Bohemian Rhapsody. The that uh, the Live Aid sequence is is good. It's yeah, uh, it's, it's it's pretty cool. It's, it's that one sequence is pretty good. I'll, yeah. I'll give him that. They nailed it in far as far as the look, like right down to having like the Pepsi, like there's like these cups of Pepsi, mm -hmm. and they're like in the exact position, like <laughs> like everything is yeah. like right down to how it's it, supposed to be. You know, it's uh, if you want to hear more of my thoughts about Bohemian Rhapsody, check out the Penske file where we covered that a couple years ago at this point. Um, but uh, I always thought the the thing that was such a bummer for me is that they went out of their way to recreate that footage. And I was like, why don't they just play the actual footage over the credits or something so you could see 
what they had done and also to really give you an idea of how amazing Freddie Mercury actually was. You know, because when you when you get so into we're not gonna turn this into a Bohemian Rhapsody podcast, but like it's that's fine. It's it's one of those things where it's like you get so specific in copying it. It's like, well, why are you copying it where you could I don't know. Just personal preference. But it did. Yeah. They 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 got it very, very accurately correct, yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I hear completely what you're saying. Uh, and, hey, that, that's what we do here. We talk about whatever uh, we think of at that moment. Um, no, the thing is that they got it right. I guess the plan was, yeah, we're going to give you the Live Aid sequence, and it's going to be, we're going to put you there. It's going to mm-hmm. be, you know, you haven't seen it on like 70 millimeter IMAX or however the, sure, the hell they sure. shot it, right? So like that's that's what it was about. It was turning it into this spectacle and you could appreciate it on that level, but I agree with you that it would have been interesting if they had included the original footage somewhere so that you yeah. could really compare it. Because not everybody has seen that Live Aid footage. Right, so, right, yeah. you know, you'll be like, oh, shit, they really, wow, they pulled it off. That's pretty interesting. So I, 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 can, I can agree with you there. Uh, it would have been a good thing to play over the uh, closing credits. So let's bring it back to The Simpsons. Let's wrap this up. Um... I have a question about this episode, and that is, what's the time frame? Because a lot of shit happens. A lot of shit happens in what seems to be a couple of days. Mm -hmm. They do that a lot in The Simpsons. Like, you have a lot of these, like, big events that, if you look at it from a realistic perspective, would transpire over several weeks or several months, but they seem to happen over a weekend. And that's that's kind of how this feels. It uh, it's it seems it's in line with with how they handle stuff. I think there's a lot of reality that's pretty uh, 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 rubbery on The Simpsons. Whether it's the fact that you can that Springfield has a desert, but it also has mountains, and it also has like tropical climate, whatever they need, or uh, the sh- the in- interior spaces shift for the purpose of a joke or whatever. I, it, they, they always play kind of fast and loose with that stuff. So it doesn't, it's never really bothered me that they do so much in, in so little time. Well, apparently yeah. what seems like so little time. Yeah. I mean, cause I mean, I guess you're just supposed to, it's all oh, there. It, there's like a magic realism aspect to it, right? Because it's like, exactly. it's like a developing story. So you got to think if, if it's an event that is getting nationwide coverage, one imagines. And on top of that, you have this charity single featuring Sting, the Itchy and Scratchy cartoon dedicated to like the, the Timmy O'Toole. You go like, that stuff takes time. That stuff, it doesn't happen overnight. And then, uh, yeah, all of it really. And it, it You're sort right. of gives, I, gives, <laughs> I want a season long arc where every couple episodes they check back on Timmy O'Toole and it, and it finds out he's been in there for 14 weeks. <laughs> yeah well i mean that's how a realistic show would do it right, right. yes, yes. <laughs> but uh but yeah and uh that's about it i mean uh this is uh the first appearance of the i i, I want to call it the axel f pastiche uh, yeah Alf Clausen does the bah, 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 yeah um it's something that shows up a bunch of times throughout the simpsons at least back then which uh, you hear when bart's trying to you know, go down to recover his radio. Yeah, uh, I uh, I was I was thinking about that because I, I was thinking, man, I'm I'm surprised that they went for and maybe it's it's maybe it's the age of the writers or something, but I was surprised that they went for Axel F instead of Mission Impossible, because usually Mission Impossible is the kind of pastiche you would get, and I guess it's it's kind of a mix of both, I guess, a little bit, but it's definitely more Beverly Hills Cop than it is Mission Impossible. Yeah, yeah, um, and I think you're right in terms of it being the age, the ages of the writers, mm-hmm. where maybe. Um, Although that's never stopped them from making Citizen Kane references, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly, or or basing an entire episode around Ace in the Hole, right? And forgetting right. and forgetting to tell the writer that that's what they're doing, right? Right. Uh, <laughs> But uh, but that's uh, that yeah um, it is interesting to to look at that because it, it is something that you don't really think about but yeah I think that in ninety one ninety two the writers most of them at least were still fairly young like they'd come up you know through TV some of them but mm-hmm. there were others that were fairly young like they were just getting into it um, so they're in their you know they're in their thirties let's say mm-hmm. you know which which is believe it or not young. Um, <laughs> So, so yeah, 
Grasping the child firmly in his talons, Socrates here will fly him to safety. Just watch. I don't think he's coming back. All right, so what's our final word on this episode? Um, I like it a lot. I think it's really well written. I think the uh, um, the payoff with the label maker is fantastic. Um, and it's it's you get a it's a good early era Simpsons episode because you get a lot of good jokes, but there is still heart built into it. Um, it is it's more than just make it's more than just the gags the the story at the uh, at the center of it of Bart. Um, the sort of uh, uh, boy who cried wolf aspect of it to a certain extent is is really effective, I think. Um, and it's a it's a good early example of Lisa kind of being the conscience of Bart that he never really listens to, um, but is the one who makes the uh, uh, the the conscious the conscience based arguments. Um, a, the, a joke, a, a bit that I like this time that I don't think I ever really appreciated is when uh, Homer refers to Timmy O'Toole as a hero, and Lisa <laughs> says, "Why is he a hero?" And he's like, "Well, I mean, you know, he he is." He's like, "Well, what exactly did he do that makes him a hero?" It's like, "Well, more than more than you have." <laughs> yeah, just, right. It is, yeah. It's she's she's really great for that purpose of of kind of being the young voice who can chip away at some more uh um ridiculous older older people kind of kind of things because people do that all the time they ascribe the, the word hero to people who haven't really done anything and you know right um, right but she's she's great is this the first appearance of ripped willie is this the first time he pulls his shirt off to reveal yes. that he's like huge and muscular yeah yes yes and that, and that might be why that's such a big moment you know yeah, why yeah. they they focus on he's appeared before not tons of times right, but he right. has appeared uh but yeah this is the first time that that they make a point of that um and it's the first sort of uh body based humor mm -hmm. uh, ascribed to Willie there there will be a lot more stuff having to do with him and the way he dresses and the way he looks and I do I really appreciate that they kept that as a running gag that he's just just always uh, muscular when he derobes because it seems like you could easily do that as like a one-off gag or something but the fact that they stick with it is 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 great Jeez, Mom, Dad. all right so uh this has been a great talk as usual it's been a lot of fun yeah thanks man uh, so i'm just gonna throw it to you now to please Tell our listeners where they can continue to find you, where they can go to listen to you talk more about Bohemian Rhapsody, and I think that they definitely should do that. Well, uh, if you'd like to hear that, if you can head over to – you can search on your podcast app for The Penske File, uh, or you can head over to YouTube and search the name of The Penske File. That should bring up our, our page where we have all sorts of stuff. We mainly We're mainly a Star Trek podcast. We're start. We're currently just started season three of Enterprise, uh, but we've covered uh, Star the Star Wars movies. Uh, we just did. A, we were covering Wandavision. Um, we've done a whole bunch of movies and TV and stuff. And I've also got a show called The Rotten Horror Picture Show, where myself and my co-host Amanda talk about films off of the Rotten Tomatoes 200 Best Horror Movies of All Time list which is a lot of fun, and uh, I do a show called The Bat-Ass Podcast where myself and DC Comics artist Sean Murphy talk about Batman the Animated Series, which should be, we just finished season three of that. We should be coming back for season four uh, fairly soon, I believe. All right, cool. Well, I mean, I will definitely be providing uh, helpful links in the episode description, and I look forward to our next conversation. Yeah, me too, man. Thanks a lot. There's a hole in my heart as deep as the well for that poor little boy who's stuck halfway to hell. Though we can't get him out, we'll do the next best thing. We'll go on TV and sing, sing, sing. And we're sending our love down the well. All the way down. We're sending our love down the well. Down that well. 
and our new number one hit, I Do Believe We're Naked, by Funky See Funky Do, replaces We're Sending Our Love Down the Well, which plunges all the way down to number 97. So that's it for this week's installment of The Simpsons Countdown. Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed this, consider showing your support. It's really very simple. Give us a like or a favorable rating. This podcast is available on Apple, Spotify, Anchor FM, and other podcasting platforms, so adding a brief review whenever possible might actually help boost the podcast's profile. And if it isn't too much trouble, please do share this with all your friends on social media. Speaking of social media, you can follow the Eric's Antoine Network on Facebook or subscribe to it on YouTube. You can also follow me on Twitter, at Eric's Antoine Net, and feel free to find me and follow me on Letterboxd, where I frequently post film reviews you may or may not agree with, that's up to you. Also, I can't stress this enough, you'll be doing yourself a favor by going over to the Penske file and checking out some of those podcasts. Even if Star Trek is not your bag, There are still plenty of other great things to check out there, covering all manner of TV and film-related topics. In any case, I'll be providing helpful links in the episode description, along with Twitter and Instagram links, so you can stalk Clay on social media if you are so inclined. I'm Eric's Antoine, and I'll be back next week to discuss Lisa the Greek, in which Lisa and Homer bond over her ability to predict the results of a football game, which brings joy and good fortune to the family, until everything turns sour, as it tends to in an episode of The Simpsons, my good friend Chris Prentice will be on hand to discuss that with me, and I hope you'll join us. In the meantime, stay safe out there, get vaccinated as soon as you can. See you soon. Power Lords! Let's get rescue warriors. I am Lord Power, leader of the Lords! Big Dog has four fists! Sidon is finished. <laughs> Power Lords. And Empowerless Sidon, Griptog, and Arkansas are each sold separately. Shh.